And moving on to the next tab, which is going to be travel. So the travel portion is all about uh, what is your nozzle doing when it's not actually printing? And generally it's just associated with something called retraction. So retraction is kind of the workaround to getting stringing in a part. Stringing is those really thin, almost spider webs uh, of plastic in your print when it's moving from one support to another and gravity is just wanting to ooze out plastic naturally. And what retraction does is instead of continuing to push out plastic, it actually sucks it in a little bit just for a moment and then relieves the stress. Um, there's a bit of a myth that it forms a vacuum uh, of plastic in there, that's not really true. It just moves the plastic out of the way until it's starting to ooze out and then relieves that pressure. Um, when you're talking about retraction, usually you're only dealing with two values. How far is it pulling back? That's the retraction distance. And then how fast is it pulling back? Um, these two values are really, really important. They're very easy to mix up as far as the results that we'll get into. Um, and so for the current time, uh, you can leave it as my values. I have it as four millimeters for the retraction distance and 35 millimeters per second for the retraction speed. Um, these are pretty normal values. Um, they're right in the middle of what, what uh, people usually expect. Um, but when we get into the testing and calibration course, uh, which will be in a couple of weeks, then you guys will actually be performing some of your retraction tests and you can absolutely nail in those values. So the next time you start a print, it will be absolutely flawless. Um, when we are going through all of this, we're saying, yep, I would like to enable retraction and I want to set my distance and my speed. Everything else on here uh, isn't too, too important. It is purely just these values. Now, if you set your retraction values too low, if you say, oh, I'm only pulling it back one millimeter and I'm pulling back really slow at like five millimeters per second, um, it causes such a small amount of difference that it's kind of hard to notice if it's even working whatsoever. And when it's moving, it, plastic will just leak out of the nozzle and you'll get spider webs everywhere and doesn't look all that good. If you then go too far on the other side of the extreme, if you say, oh, I want to pull back like 10 millimeters and go at like 100 millimeters per second, really pull it back super quick, then not only will your extruder not be able to keep up with that speed, um, but you're actually now pulling molten plastic into the PTFE tube, which then cools back down and then you're doing it over and over and over again. And it will then cause this buildup of plastic in there, which can then cause a clog. Um, if you find that after printing for days and days and days and days that if you want to change out to a different filament and you will heat up your nozzle, compress the spring and then try and pull out your filament, if you notice that it's really, really, really hard to pull it out, it's very likely that you just have a clog. You've got some cooled solidified plastic inside your PTFE tube and you'll have to heat it up, pull it out and then chop off the end a little bit but this is a very, very common part of 3D printing that you'll come across uh, all the time in discussions. Uh, moving onwards into the cooling. This is a pretty, pretty basic part of 3D printing. It is how cold or how much of the fan power are you actually putting onto your 3D part? When you've got a molten plastic and it's actually being laid down, uh, after it's the extruder, it is still molten, it's still liquid, and it takes a certain amount of time for it to solidify and cool down. And with 3D printing, we want that to be as fast as possible. The longer amount of times it says liquid, the more likely it's gonna ooze and your dimensions are gonna get, uh, are gonna be not as accurate. Your surface quality isn't gonna be nice and clean. It's gonna be a little droopy. Uh, and so having your fan set at 100% uh, is basically all you need. Um, it's going to be using the fan on the very right hand side of your nozzle, which then blows it through a duct and it aims it at one side of your nozzle and cools things down pretty well. Um, there are a lot of mods online of people that will then hack on another fan on the other side or even three fans or they'll have a little ducting that blows air all the way around your nozzle and this is to make sure that you've got cooling air going all the way around. Uh, sometimes if you print a 3D part it may look really good on one side but then on the other, it looks a little bit worse. And that's just kind of telling you, hey, your fan is keeping this side of your part really, really cold and really nice. 
For this part, it's cooling down much, much slower. And so you'll get a little bit more droopy effect. Um, I'll link with you guys a bunch of different hacks you can put on there, but for the beginner 3D printer, you really don't need it all that much. What I would recommend is to actually set your initial fan speed, uh, how much cooling abilities you have for your very first layer to 0%. Uh, we want that first layer to stay as liquidy as possible for as long as it can, so it can ooze into the grit of the bed and give you much stronger, uh, stronger force. Um, I've also said, hey, get up to the regular fan speed at layer four. So it means it'd be 0%, and then the next layer, 25, 50, 75%, and then by the time it gets up there, it will then be maximum cooling all the way through. And this is a pretty, pretty standard value, and it'll mean that your part will have a better chance of succeeding of grabbing onto the very first layer. So moving on from cooling, we have our support tab. Now support is a sparse density material that is basically just used to hold up your 3D printed object. If you know that you could be printing something that is going to be hanging in midair or has got a really steep angle, then you can put in a support material to support it. It almost acts as a structure that it can print on top of and then you can break it off and clean it up after the fact. When you're talking about support material, there's really only two different values that we need to worry about and that is what is the type of structure and what is the overhang angle. Normally, we would set this to normal, which will give us this kind of blocky, uh, a blocky low density material around there that'll just touch on our project just a little bit. And there's a certain amount of air gap associated with it so that when it gets to that angle, it droops a little bit, lands onto your support material, and then as soon as it's all done, you can break that off. And then you've only got a little bit of a surface defect to deal with. But with the more current versions of Cura, we can actually change this over to tree support. And tree support will work by having this really large trunk at the very bottom, and then it will kind of organically uh, conf uh, contort around your 3D object to then branch off into smaller and smaller branches so that it will be as smart as possible and it won't interfere with your object at all. So I basically always choose tree support over normal. Just gives me a much better effect. Um, the support overhang angle is also a really, really important feature. So when you're talking about overhang in 3D objects, you're gonna be referring to what angle is it where it'll start to droop too much and it'll give you too bad surface quality and you need some kind of structure to hold it up. Um, for me, I've set 75 degrees as my overhang angle. That's what I've kind of viewed from my printers and said, yeah, that's an acceptable value. That looks pretty good, I can find with that. Um, basically with all 3D printers, they can print at 45 degree angles and less perfectly fine. But with more and more printers where it has a higher cooling value, then you can print steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper. So for this benchy right now, uh, setting it at 75 uh, degrees, there really won't be any support material because there's nothing steeper than that. There is some red areas underneath where we have bridging, where it's actually technically completely horizontal, but it's less than that five millimeters we talked about earlier. And so if we preview this, yeah, we have a little bit of support material right on the underside, but not all that much. So this blue section here, this is my tree support. So it's actually analyzed and it said, hey, this section right on the top of the roof here, this is actually steeper than 75 degrees. And so it will make some support material that our top roof can then actually rest upon and then it will print much, much nicer. And we do have a little bit of an air gap in between it. So you can see that's the top layer of the support. And then we have a couple uh, air gaps in between and then it prints on there. And as we can see with our, uh, with our tree, it starts off with this large trunk and then it will contort around uh, our object. It won't actually interfere with it at all. It'll go through there and then kind of branch off a little bit more and then grab onto a part. So this is a really, really clever way to have all the support material that you need for your 3D printed object.